Hey guys, welcome to another episode of All Queued Up. Uh, we're going to stop calling it the unofficial Netflix podcast. You're going to see it, you know, around here and whatnot. But the reason we're going to change the title or change the that that aspect is still called All Queued Up, but it's because we want to kind of venture out and do Hulu originals, uh, Amazon originals, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, like, uh, you know, like when the Tick season two comes out, I'd like to, you know, review that on the show or... Uh, wasn't there a show on, or like Future Man or something like that? I don't know. Yeah, Future Man on Hulu. Yeah, we're not restricted to Netflix only. We were just doing it for a little while to kind of get the show rolling. But, um, but anyway, guys, if you don't know what the show's about, Josh and I here, we review uh, two shows probably on Netflix. Again, we're going to venture out. Um, but uh, what we do is we spoil the hell out of it. We talk about everything that we enjoyed and didn't enjoy about the show. We give our recommendations at the end. And uh, we, um, yeah, we do about, I think we do about 20 minutes per show. So that's that. Uh, this episode, we are talking about two shows. We are talking about a documentary called Jim and Andy. And there's a long subtitle to it that I'm not going to read. But um, I guess Jim and Andy, the great beyond would probably be the better way to say that. Uh, um, and then the other show is Marvel's The Punisher. Um, and I'm excited to talk about both. I think uh, I think Josh, you are also on board with talking about both. Quite oh yeah, well. yeah. Um, watched uh, Jim and Andy the night it came out, and I saved the Punisher until this weekend, and watched it all Sunday night, Monday, and finished it up Tuesday afternoon. I think I watched Jim and Andy the like Saturday after it came out because it came out on Friday, and then Punisher. I was like. I watched four episodes and then had to help a friend move over Thanksgiving break and then, like, had to watch the rest. So it was like a solid week between watching, like, in the middle of Punisher. But um, yeah, uh, where Madison was home for an entire week from school uh, because of Thanksgiving break, I didn't want to watch the Punisher with her that's, being. Because, that is probably smart. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's one thing for you know, at home I don't censor myself language wise, so I don't have a problem with her hearing language. But I don't want to expose her to that level of mature themes. So it is. So Punisher. That's that's something. Thank you for mentioning that. That's something I want to bring up real quick. So we do talk about spoilers. So that is a warning. But also, guys, we uh, both Punisher and Jim and Andy uh, have some very heavy themes to them. Um, much like last week with the two shows we reviewed, there these have heavy themes. So if it's if it's stuff that is not interest to you, if it if it maybe touches some buttons that you don't like definitely you know skip to the either either show or just don't listen to the episode at all it's totally acceptable um not everything is going to be for everybody so that's that's your fair warning right there um real quick before we get to the episodes i want to i want to say to follow us on uh follow the website mission start podcast on twitter at mission start p uh follow this this podcast at queued up podcast on twitter um, this is also where you could throw suggested shows at us, or if you want to be a guest on the on an episode, uh, definitely hit us up. Uh, you can follow me at Chub Rock Geek and Josh. Where they can where they can where can they follow you on Twitter? Uh, at N Sabanur one nine seven six. And there you go. All right, so um, we're going to start with Jim and Andy, uh, just because I think that uh, I want to get into that one. That's why I want to start with it. I want to get into that one. Um, so I'm hitting my timer and we are good to go. Okay. So Jim and Andy, if you don't know, is a documentary about when Jim Carrey played Andy Kaufman and his subsequent characters that Andy Kaufman played in a movie called Man on the Moon. Um, when Jim did the movie, uh, he went full method actor. And, uh, and if you don't know what method acting is, it's basically embodying the role outside of filming as well. Um, I personally think method acting is a ridiculous form of acting uh, simply because there's that disconnect where if you are pretending to be that character off camera, there's a part of your brain that knows you're not on camera. When an actor is going, I'm playing a character and they're on camera, they're that character. When the cameras turn off, they're back to being themselves. But method actors go like, well, if I'm playing the Joker, Jared Leto, then I got to be the Joker offset. But he can't go around and just kill people. Like, he can't be the Joker offset because technically that's illegal. So he sends, like, 
dead rats to people like okay that's not really what the joker does but i guess if you want to call that method acting go right ahead um sorry small tangent getting back to to his band i i just i can't stand method acting i think it's an 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 absurd form of acting but anyway yeah it um, is a bit overboard i agree uh but so so to say jim talks about going into method acting as andy kaufman um the problem was is that about halfway through the filming uh, or actually during the entire filming, um, they were doing a documentary, like a, like a behind the scenes sort of thing. And about halfway through that filming, uh, Paramount came and said, like, we're not, we're not using any of the footage because Jim has been a consistent asshole on set being as Andy Kaufman. And, uh, um, we're afraid that he, like, if people see this, they'll think Jim's an asshole. And at the time, Jim was, you know, a huge star. You know, he was still riding off of Mask and Ace Ventura and uh, Dumb and Dumber. Dumb and Dumber. So like, and liar, liar. Exactly. So it was like it was like they did not want Jim to look to have a to look in a bad light. So they just didn't have they didn't want to air the footage ever. So that's where this documentary comes from. It was Jim. It was interviewing Jim now and showing the footage. Um, that's basically all the documentary is. And boy, has he changed. Well. I want to say he hasn't changed. Like he's matured, so maybe that's the change you're referring to. But yeah, yeah. I personally, here's my thing about Jim Carrey. I think the dude is a brilliant comedian, um, and and possibly brilliant actor. But aside from that, the dude believes in a lot of pseudoscience. Yes, he does. Yes, a lot of bunk does. science, if you will, and that that is a huge disconnect for me. Um, towards the end of the documentary, he starts talking about a bunch of like spiritual shit that i was just like whoa bro like no <laughs> yeah that was the thing that kind of got to me i don't mean to cut you off there but go right ahead the whole um how he decided he would accept the role he said that andy came to him on the beach and gave him a sign of the dolphins he's like okay i have Andy's to do gonna do his own movie i'm like yeah or whispered okay. to him you know andy's doing his own movie I'm like okay you're a little weird there, but sure, I see your inspiration. Don't take everything so literal, dude. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Well, this is the same guy that when he was with Jenny McCarthy spouted absolutes of like uh, vaccines give autism. Like he f- still believes that to this day. Um, yeah. And, and and it definitely shows like the when he talks about when he's not talking about like retelling stuff that happened on set or like where he felt about things. Um, Oh, sorry. Sorry guys. I have a little bit of like a, like a sinus cold. So bear with me. But um, like, there's a lot of times where like, I'm just like, Jim, you are, you are taking this to a level that I can't follow at all. And it was so hard for me to watch this without being in the third person perspective. What I mean by that is like, usually when I watch a documentary, I can find myself inside somebody else. I can say like, oh, I see myself in that person, you know? With this, it was like I was just watching it. Like, like I did. Total, total observer, not trying to identify or relate in any way. Because he's so far gone into it that it's pretty much impossible for a casual person, a normal person, to relate to it or identify with it in any way. Uh, exactly. That that was my feelings exactly. And but from that perspective, it was absolutely fascinating. Which is what I was getting ready to say. That's what made it so fascinating for me is just to see the degree that. He was just like, all right, I'm Andy, and I'm Tony. And, you know, Tony is a separate person from Andy, and Andy is a separate person from Jim. And it's just, it's like once they got there on the set the first day, Jim Carrey disappeared from the first day they started filming until the day they wrapped, even off set, off the lot. He was either in Tony or Andy mode the entire time. It was incredibly weird to see. Super weird. 
Well, there's that there's that scene that that Jim retells about the director like calling Jim at his house and is like, I want to talk to Jim, you know, like. And and uh, the director was like, I can't stand Tony or Andy. And Jim was like, Well, we can fire them, and then I can come in and pretend to be Andy. And I was like, In my mind, I went, That's the dumbest fucking thing I've ever heard in my life. Like, I'm sure that there's actors out there just going, Well, you just don't know what he's talking about because he's not an actor. But you have to put it in the context of like all actors pretend to be somebody else. And at this time, regardless of the method acting format, Jim is still pretending to be Andy. Jim may think it's Andy projecting himself through him, but he's still pretending to be Andy. So whether he was acting as Andy or doing this method acting as Andy, he'd still be a really good Andy Kaufman. Oh, so yeah, he was it's, brilliant. It's, it was so bizarre to me to hear about that conversation. And, like, I was it Robert Zemeckis that made it? Made Man on the Moon? I believe it was. No, it was Milo Schwerman, wasn't it? I, I'm drawn up completely. It was the same dude that directed Cuckoo's Nest. Right, 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 which makes sense. Um, which uh, is also a favorite of mine. Man on the Moon. Do, 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 do. I fucking I also love this movie. Like I adore this film. Um, oh, Man on the Moon. Milo For, yeah, Milo Milos Foreman. Yeah, Milos Foreman. I said Milos. My apologies. It's fine. If he uh, ever sees this, Milos, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> if he ever watched our podcast, I'd I'd I'd, I'd shit myself. Um. Uh. <laughs> Hell, I would too, and then I'd show the video evidence. Yeah, there you go. There you uh, go. There's an incentive. I mean, there was some like really fun stuff that I think they did on set that I thought was really cool. Where uh, uh, his friend Bob, uh, I can't remember his name, um, Bob Zamuda, Bob Zamuda would would you know like with like but when Bob Zamuda was friends with Andy Kaufman, they would both be playing Tony Clifton, um, and uh, uh, so so Bob Zamuda went to the Playboy Mansion as Tony Clifton, and then when, like everyone was like, "Is that Jim? Is that not Jim?" And then when Jim shows up, like that's brilliant. I love that stuff. Like that's Andy Kaufman to a T. But it did it 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 was overshadowed by like you know Jim going like that wasn't really me. That was Andy Kaufman. I was just doing what Andy Kaufman wanted me to do. I was like. <sighs> It's so yeah. brilliant, and then you detract from it so hard, Jim. What are you doing? Um, I don't know. Like I, it was it, like a lot of the fascinating stuff definitely came from Sorry. the fact that it's fine. Um, life stuff, guys. Shit happens. Uh, um, it came from like watching the footage on set. That was what was fascinating. It's almost a case study for a particular like mental instability. You know, um, I, I can see that. Uh, I'd say one of my one of the, the one of the things that both irritated me and and fascinated me to a very large extent was his interactions with Jerry the King Lawler. Yes, uh, because if you know the history of Andy Kaufman, you know that Andy and Jerry were good friends. When they weren't on camera, they were planning their next big, you know, heel and face thing. Yeah, um, like wrestling. Andy deal. understood. Andy understood that the wrestling business and how it's you know presented. Well, honestly, if it weren't for Andy, a lot of things that the wrestling did in the eighties wouldn't have existed. This is true. Like Andy, kind of to an extent, invented the face heel format. Um, that's a to an extent because I think there were still good guys, bad guys. But... Well, I mean, there was a face and heel format long before Andy did that. Right, but, that's right, yeah, but but the way that Andy did it was was what made it so different and unique. Yeah, you didn't have you would have heels come in, and usually they would because uh, back then everything was territorial. Heels would come in and you know rile up the crowd, generalizing and everything. But never were I don't think women the target, and you know how Andy right. came in targeting the women. Oh, you know, you shouldn't be here. You should be back at home in the kitchen, barefoot and pregnant and making me a sandwich. And, you know, men are superior and all that. That was that was a pretty new thing. And boy, did it incense the Mid-South Coliseum. 
I mean, that that was what was so brilliant about it was that Andy knew what he was doing, and um, Jim didn't. Uh, a full on like, from my perspective, watching that footage, it showed very much that Jim didn't know what Andy's mm-hmm. intents were. That Jim didn't didn't have, uh, uh, you know, Jim said like, oh well, Andy was coming through me. Then why didn't Andy go up to Jerry at this much later date and and hug him and say like it's been a while, friend? Mm-hmm. Instead, yeah, was because... Jim, Jim, Jim was doing what he had seen. Jim did, was Jim was doing what he thought the relationship between them was. Exactly, and Lawler even tried to tell him, he's like he was my friend. Off camera, we were friends. Everything else on the camera was all for show. Jerry but never said on like, the camera. Jerry never said I hey andy he always said like jim is an asshole yeah yeah and that's another thing that kind of really i felt his whole i'm going to treat lawler you know just a piece of garbage and he tormented jerry lawler the entire time just tormented and he was asking for it but look at what he did with andy kaufman's daughter and andy kaufman's father yeah that's true that is true. He's like, oh, my daughter, who I've never seen, let's have a chat. Let's let's get to know each other and catch up, you know? And he's well, going on about how Andy's daughter finally got to meet Andy. No. Andy's daughter got to meet a guy who was playing her dad. Yeah. Sorry, Jim. You can't have it both ways and say that you brought you yourself channeling Andy Kaufman brought closure to a family, but yet at the same time, Oh, this is how Andy would have done with Jerry Lawler. You can't have it both ways, dude. You just fucking can't. Exactly. Like I'm glad that, that Andy's family came forward and that Bob Zamuda came forward and that his ex-girlfriend came forward was like, Jim was like one to one to Andy Kaufman on set. Like, I'm glad to hear that because that made the movie authentic. Yes. But at the end of the day, if you ask any of them, it wasn't Andy Kaufman. It just wasn't. It was Jim playing Andy Kaufman. And no matter how many times Jim in that interview wants to say that it wasn't him and that it was Andy, I call bullshit. I just absolutely call bullshit. Exactly. Um, He's I just... Think... Go ahead. Uh... He needs to take a step back and look in the mirror and take a good, long, hard look at what he is saying. Because, I mean, like you said, he's been spouting a lot of nonsense, pseudoscience, bunk science, bullshit for a while. But at the same time, and it kind of comes into play is what he said, you know, after the filming, he had been method acting as Andy and Tony for so long, he didn't know who he was anymore. He didn't know what his politics were anymore. He didn't know how to go back to being Jim. I mean, I think he needs to take a good hard look and examine himself because a lot of the stuff he was saying, I just felt was horseshit. Um, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely. And to pass it off and say these things and, but you can't treat everything equally just, you know, reinforces my belief that it's horseshit. Yeah. I completely agree. I think, um, like, I love the idea that Jim, you know, what Jim talks about with, like, Andy being a different person and and how he saw the world was different than anybody else and that maybe Jim sees the world differently as well. Um, I totally get that. As somebody Mm -hmm. who's been around entertainers pretty much my whole life, um, I totally understand that, 100%. But also you know, like there has to be a disconnect. There has to be a point where you go, you have to take a look at in the mirror and say like, is what I'm saying and doing, does it make any sense? You know, it, it is what I'm saying and doing um, bullshit or not. And I don't think that Jim has ever done that. I don't think Jim has ever taken a step back and said that what he's doing is ridiculous or whatever. He just does it. And uh yeah. It's it's hard to believe that he has, um, based on watching that. I mean, it, it's like I said, I think it's very much well worth the watch, simply from the standpoint of like, this is the psyche of a man. 
who has lived a very different life from everybody else. Um, it is fascinating to see how Jim's mind works. When it comes down to his acting methods, when it comes down to how he sees the world, when it comes down to um, uh, how he viewed the whole experience of playing Andy, um, it, it's it's unbelievably interesting to me how far he was willing to go and how ridiculous his thought process was. I think that's interesting. What I think everybody needs to do watching it, though, is watch it from the third person perspective. Don't read everything he says as fact or as more than just, like we say, bunk science. Um, you know, look at it from the standpoint of this is a man who saw a lot of himself in Andy Kaufman and decided that instead of like he sat down one day, maybe it was at that beach and went, I'm going to method act this. And uh, I don't know. It's just like, I talked to my brother about it on Thanksgiving. Well, a couple of days after Thanksgiving, whatever. And my brother kind of looked at me like I didn't understand Jim. Now my brother is an interesting guy. I'll just say that. Um, but I don't think there are a lot of people that would understand or side with Jim on this. At least I'd hope not. Cause it's hard for me to sit there and say what Jim says at the end of the documentary makes sense. The whole thing about free will was so bizarre to me. Yeah, that was, I was like, dude, just because, you know, oh, you're thirsty, therefore you drink the tea, you have no free will. Um, okay, yeah, I don't think that's how free will works, dude. Yeah, he free was using will free has the will. choice to drink or not, but your body requires it. It's not so much the choice to drink or not. Choice of what you drink. There's your free will. Oh, my God. He's just... Yeah. He's kind of like on the extremes of these pseudo scientifical beliefs. Yeah, yeah, it was but, like, yeah. At the end of the day, it doesn't detract that I think he's a very talented comedic actor. Oh, I, I agree. And I can do agree. some wonderful dramatic roles as well. I mean, Truman Show still, I love that movie. It was a great movie. I haven't seen him in anything recently that, like, I was like, oh my god! But Eternal, Eternal, Eternal Sunshine of the uh, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Mind. Yeah, that's a that great was, film. Mm, yes, um, but yeah, he's uh, not done a lot since he did Kick Ass Two, and then right before doing all the press junkets before it hits, he just kind of went on this whole tirade about how he regretted doing it and it promoted too much violence and this and that. I'm like, well, dude, why don't you take the multi million dollar check and cash it then and take the role? Yeah, you know, like you don't. I'm sure he didn't need for the money because he talked about. In that interview, how he's just given up the desire for all possessions and everything. Like, really? Really? You don't have any desire for anything else? Okay. <laughs> I just, some of the stuff he was saying about his personal beliefs, I felt were bullshit. But I agree. That's that's the point I'm getting at. Like, that, that shit, was, I was just like, mm -mm, nope. All right. Well, we've hit the time limit for talking about it. So we're going to get to recommendations. Uh, like I said, I think it's a fascinating documentary, it's well worth the watch. Just take everything that he says with a grain of salt. Um, look at it from the case study of like a psych, like a psych major, if you will, um, or minor. I don't know. Um, hmm. uh, that's where that's where I enjoyed it. I enjoyed watching like the the behind the scenes and what people were saying and like just just again, it's also documentary. So take that like take every documentary you watch with a grain of salt. Um, so yeah, I do recommend it. I highly recommend it. It's very fascinating to watch. Josh, what do you think? I thought it was a lot of fun. Uh, I enjoyed the, you know, footage more than the actual interview itself because, like I said, a lot of the things he was he was saying, I just felt hard to swallow. Some of the things he said were very interesting and eyebrow raising, but for the actual documentary footage itself, that stuff was wonderful to watch. Yeah, 
especially how people that actually knew Andy and acted with Andy were just going on about it is so unreal how close he is to the genuine article. But at the same time, never coming off of being either Andy or Tony, how it drove everyone nuts. And how when Jerry Lawler, when they were on the Letterman set, when he was like, okay, hit me, instead of doing the stunt double, Lawler clocked the dog shit out of him, for real. Yep. And he was like, oh, it felt, I remember Lawler talking about saying how good it felt to hit him. Uh, in other articles I've seen with him and in interviews I've seen with him in the past. But, yeah, I mean, it's it's a strong recommend for me if you enjoy the movie, if you enjoy the character of Andy Kaufman, uh, if you enjoy Jim Carrey, or if you just like seeing things from a historical, like behind-the-scenes Hollywood kind of thing. A very fun watch, but, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. It is very interesting and fascinating. So, yeah, I recommend it. Okay, um, so on to the next show. Um, the Punisher. If you don't know who the Punisher is, <laughs> uh, you either A, have not read many Marvel comics as a kid, watched the Spider-Man cartoon series, which he was on a couple times, or you didn't watch uh, Daredevil Season 2. That's currently on Netflix. Uh, Punisher is a character, or watched any of the various movies that have come out over the years. Um mm -hmm. Dolph Lundgren played him in the 80, or the early 90s. Mm -hmm. uh, Thomas Jane played him in the early 2000s. And then a few years later, Ray, uh, Ray Stevenson played or him. Ray Stevenson. In, yeah. Uh, played him in Warzone. Um, to me, I think the most faithful adaptation of Punisher out of those three films was Thomas Jane. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of like who, in my mind, the Punisher is. Uh, the cheesiest one is by far the the Dolph Lundgren one. Oh yeah. And then if you just love ultra violence, that's all Warzone is. It's just Punisher being Punisher. And um, Warzone was very underrated in my opinion. Mm hmm. I thought it was much better than than the ratings it gave. Anyway, um, but to say the least, if uh, if you're not if you're unclear on who the Punisher is, I just started the timer, so we're gonna have a little extra time on this one. Um. Uh. In the 70s, I want to say the late 70s, uh, Punisher was introduced in Spider-Man uh, issue something or other. I don't know I why. I think 129, that. I think. <laughs> I, it, it, honestly, I, you're probably right. I mean, there's 12 issues a year, so at that point, it could have been 129. But uh, Punisher was brought in to, um, like, a hitman to, to kill Spider-Man because he thought Spider-Man was a bad guy. Um, and then when, when, when Frank had figured out that Peter was not a bad guy and was a superhero, he didn't kill him, but you know, he did try to make, uh, um, Spider-Man understand that maybe what he was doing wasn't working, you know, that like just putting bad guys in jail isn't, isn't solving the problem. And that's where I think Punisher has always been a cool character for me. Um, especially when he's, you know, gone up against character, like gone up with characters like Daredevil or, uh, um, just any other, of these no kill characters, no kill superheroes. Um, and, uh, cause Punisher, that's, that's what Punisher does. He, he doesn't care what your offense has been. If he, if he deems you worthy of death, then he will kill you. Um, but he primarily targets mafia gangs, stuff like that. Um, so the show decides to take a different route. <laughs> kind of, kind of. Uh, most of the Punisher stories are about Punisher, um, taking out a mob boss or a mob organization. Something to that effect. I mean, even the video games are kind of that way. Sometimes Kingpin. Oh, pardon me. Um, but this, this was different. So, the origin of Frank in the comics is that gangsters had a, had a war in Central Park and killed his family. Um, in the comic, it's like, it's his mother, it's his, it's his uh, mother, it's his, it's his wife and son. Uh, in the Dolph Lundgren movie, it was wife and son. In the uh, second movie, it was, or in the Thomas Jane one, it was like his entire extended family. Um, 
And then in uh, – I don't know if they ever said it in the Ray Stevenson one. In the Ray Stevenson one, it was already established. It was a sequel to the Punisher Thomas Jane movie, but they had just recast. Because that – yeah, what I was going to say is I don't remember them saying it. I remember just him going and, and ultra-violent killing everybody. Yeah. Um, but then again, it's been years since I've seen it. Point I'm getting at is in this movie or in in the Netflix show, they take a different route in the idea that he had a wife, daughter, and son, and that the government secretly killed his family. Um, again, we are talking spoilers here, so be prepared. Uh, but the idea is that um, Frank Castle was part of a secret CIA operative in an Afghanistan or in Iraq. Was it Iraq? No, it's Afghanistan. Was it Afghanistan? Okay. Mm-hmm. Because I knew that he said he went to Afghanistan, but I couldn't remember if that was in Iraq or Afghanistan. But anyway, um, because it was secret ops, like the guy who ran the program and somebody that was also on part of the team um, were killing off, were finding and killing off all the members of this of this uh, secret operative because they might talk. They, they might come forward with the war crimes that were committed. Um, so when that happened to Frank, it, it, they, you know, they ended up killing his entire family. And so Frank is now on the warpath to find them and kill them. Um, in the comics, uh, Frank has had a, uh, I don't want to say partner. <laughs> has never been a partner, like an acquaintance that's also kind of a help named Micro or Microchip. Yeah. And Micro is in this show, but he's not like he has ever been before. Um, I Micro. loved Macro in the show. I agree. Um, in, in the comics and the other sh- in the other adaptations of Micro, he's an uber nerd who just has like a secret, super you know fortified computer base essentially. Um, and in this, he's also a super like he he you know he's very well. Uh, I don't want to say well versed in tech because that's not correct. He's Oh, he's definitely a technophile. Technophile. Uh, that's, that's perfect. He was a uh, former NSA analyst and very tech savvy. There you go. And because he was sent the video of these illegal black ops executions of an Afghani police officer, and because he was sent that video and he showed it to someone in the Homeland Security, that is what got him targeted. Right, and, and his, he he ends up faking his death and finding Frank, and they agree to take out everybody involved. Yeah, and um, he is shot in front of his wife by Homeland Security, and everybody thinks he's dead. They never recovered his body, but he had a cell phone in his pocket, and the bullet, you know, it hurt him, but it didn't kill him. Right. So he's been secretly living in an abandoned power plant i think it was for like a year yeah for about a year uh i just loved his whole setup you know and just how he kept tabs on his family you know the yeah. entire house he's got cameras and audio in the entire house and it's like he's there with them the entire time but of course they don't realize it and at the same time it's just like you just want him like dude just go home dude just go home but at the same time you know he can't because they would be in extreme danger because of these uh, rogue operatives trying to wipe out anybody that has knowledge of their illegal activities. Right. I think that's what was so interesting to me was this show didn't take the route of what we know of Punisher. It started like the very first like 10 minutes is where, you know, uh, Punisher is finishing off taking out a, a Mexican drug cartel. Um, you know, he snipes the dude in the head as he's about to get a blowjob. Uh, and then he kills the guy in the bathroom. Like, that was classic Punisher. That's what we know as Punisher. But this this story was so different. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I've seen the Punisher go after, um, you know, dirty secret, you know, dirty CIA, dirty, you know, uh, government workers. But never in a fashion where, where Frank was a part of it at one point. Um, yeah, I, I, I really loved how he did that. It's like, okay, this video evidence of these illegal war crimes, Frank is the one that executes under the orders of this CIA guy. He is the one that executes the Afghani cops. So by 
testifying against this guy, he would be implicating himself as well, yeah. which is what made it all that more intriguing. Yeah. Um, there's a side story going on the entire time that's, you know, slightly interjecting, and that's with, uh, I can't remember her first name, but her last name is Madani, and she is... Agent Madani. She's related in some way. I didn't quite catch that to the guy who was executed in the video. Uh, um, they were just friends, I believe. Okay. I think they were just friends because he had a wife and children. Uh, but she well, was a yeah, yeah. field agent uh, representing the U.S. in that office of Homeland Security there. And they were friends. And he had gotten wind of what was going on and killed him. Right. So her story was kind of boring, to be honest. Um, there were parts of it that were interesting, but I felt like they took a lot of time with her for some reason. Um, a lot of what she does is... Uh, it's character building, but I couldn't figure out for why, if you get my drift. Like... Going to the extent of having her talk to different people and having these conversations and, um, and, uh, sorry, my ear just popped. I don't know why. Um, it, it all seemed like it was just filler. Like, scenes where she's talking to her mom and it didn't really add anything. It just kind of like it was like, are we are we supposed to sympathize with her? Like we know that she feels this way. Like they've already established that with previous conversations. Like why are we reiterating this? I felt like, um, I don't know if you felt the same way, but I just I totally felt that way. And like for me, it detracted from what was so great about, um, you know, like uh, Frank and and Micro's interaction. Uh, oh, I loved their relationship so much. It was so good that, like, every time it went away from it to do anything else, I was just bored. I was just like, oh, my God, get back to the good stuff. Like, it's it's like being in the middle of a meal and then someone takes your plate away and hands you some vegetables. Like, you eat a delicious steak, you get, like, three bites in, and then someone's like, oh, nope, here's some vegetables, is what it felt like, you know? It's what like, kind okay, of... I kind of get why it's necessary, but I don't want it. Um, See, I didn't get that feeling. I really enjoyed... I liked Madonna. I didn't know if I liked Madonna or not for a while. Um, I got the reasons why they were showing, you know, her growth and development the way they did. I really enjoyed Stein, her partner. Uh, yeah. I really enjoyed him. He was very. Um, just, to, just to clarify, I did, and I did like her character. I just didn't. Like oh, how okay. much time. I didn't like how much time they spent. Yeah, they did seem to spend a little bit excessive time with her from time to time, but not enough to pull me out and make me want to get back to, you know, the whole Frank and Micro situation because there were a lot of different things going on in the show that didn't involve Frank and Micro directly. Like um uh Curtis, his old war friend who ran the uh veteran support group. Uh you know how you had people that, you know, focused it focused on a couple of people in that support group. You know, and how uh, his former war friend, uh, Billy, now ran a private security firm, you know, um, and turns out he's funding Oh my God, uh, Can Curtis. Like, and that, that slight sub storyline was so good. Like I was just saying, dude, like, there's also the story about the, the, um, the uh, uh, PTSD uh, soldier. Um, yeah. That yep. was awesome. I loved that stuff. And um, yeah, and then you know you've got Karen Page showing up from Daredevil, you know, now working for the Bugle, or not the Bugle, but the Bulletin, you know, in uh, Ben Urich's old office, uh, and how he's like sees her as a champion for uh, the people that have been wronged, like he viewed as Frank as being wronged before when Frank was convicted from, yeah, you know, before in the season two of Daredevil. Uh, I love how they got her involved uh, and how this PTSD having vet, he was just, man, his storyline was fascinating. 
it was it was also heartbreaking. <laughs> it, it was. It was very very sad. Um, but that's that's kind of what I'm getting at, Josh. Is like I I loved. I loved all of that stuff. I thought that all those side storylines and the main one with Frank and, and Micro and like, it was so fun to watch. And then it just stops and gives you vegetables for like a minute. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying there. I see what you're saying there. Uh, I really enjoyed how, you know, Frank, the alias that he was going by when early on after you see. Uh, Pete Castelloni. Pete Castiglione. See, in the comics, Castiglione is his real actual name, Francis Castiglione. It was after he had already done two or three tours in Vietnam is that he re-enlisted under the name Castle because he couldn't re-enlist under Castiglione anymore. Uh, But I thought that was a nice little callback to his actual comics birth name. That was a cool thing. Yeah, there's a lot of little nods everywhere throughout the show. Um, I'm trying to remember a few that I caught. But, well, uh, I, I knew yeah. early on that the ultimate overall season villain was going to be who he was because of his name. Uh, Which and one? Who he, and who he was going to be. Remember, this is spoiler casting. You can just say it. Yeah, okay. Well, Billy... That uh, owns Russo. Animal Security. Yeah, Russo. In the comics, he was a mob enforcer. Billy the Bow, Billy Russo. Who the Punisher leaves horribly uh, disfigured, and he comes back as the villain Jigsaw. Okay, okay. Dude, that Jigsaw. final yeah. showdown on at, at the carousel, when he and the Punisher are fighting, and Frank's just taking his face, and raking it across that busted mirror. That was awesome. That's uh, something that's something else I want to talk about real quick about the show. Like they really do take the violence up a notch. They really, really do in the show. And it uh, isn't often. It's not as heavy on the violence as you would think it would be. But when it is there, there are some genuine cringe worthy moments of violence where you're like <gasps> Oh, that looks oh oh you're squeamish at some points. That there, was like there there are moments where he you know he shoots somebody in the head and they don't just turn away. Um or like it's not faced on him shooting the gun, it's faced on the person who he's shooting, and you see like the CGI bullet go through their head. There's a there's a few moments where like people get shot and killed because of headshots, and I was just like, Oh, oh god. <laughs> Like um, uh, when the CIA agents are going into Billy Russo's like home or whatever, and he's taking them out one by one, and there's just shots of like the CIA agents are the forefront of of the shot, and he comes up behind them and shoots them, and you they don't turn away, they don't like you see the bullets go through the head, like it's so awesome. Um, yeah, I think that but, was his actual Anvil Securities office or something like that. Okay, okay, I couldn't remember because he was getting all of his money from the safe and everything, and then blows it up at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. I'll tell you the part that made me cringe is when the hit squad from Anvil comes into Micro and Frank's hideout and Frank's taking them out one by one. I was about to mention that. That last one that he's trying to interrogate when he comes up and he grabs him behind the head, takes out his knife and the hamstrings on the back of his legs slashes them both. So the guy can't crawl now. He can't move. I was like, oh, oh, about made me cry in pain, man. It looked painful. Yeah. It, that, that's the stuff that I really enjoy. Like, I know that that stuff's not going to be for everybody. Like, that ultraviolet stuff is going to be way too much for some people. Um, but that's Punisher. That's, that's Punisher in a nutshell. Like, yeah. any of his comics go, you know, through the day, like, that's just what he would do. Like, he just goes that far. Uh, there was a there was a PS2 video game that from a long time ago just called The Punisher, mm-hmm. and that game was brutal. Um, yeah, that's kind of what like the whole uh, with the things that occur in real world that kind of affected people's outlooks. They're like, oh, we shouldn't have this show. Absolutely, we should have this show. This is a character that's been around for forty years, thirty five, forty years in the comics. This is a character who has a known history of violence. It, you should, we should not curtail our entertainment because of real-world events. 
Um, right. It's sad that, you know, things are suffering. Um, but, you know, they can they can be a tool to say, this is why you don't want this to occur in the real world. Come on now. And they got to do. They got to do a couple times. Yeah. Especially with that senator. The oh, senator yeah. that, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't, I like, I, I really, really, really enjoyed the show. I think, uh, it was you know, very well done. Like you uh, are going to have to sit through some very boring scenes. Uh, I, I'll, I'll tell you that right now, in my opinion, I think that some of the scenes are quite boring, but as the show picks up and goes forward, especially like, during episode three, um, when micro like comes in mainly, and there's that, there's the final, like there's the actual interaction between those two and that chemistry there. And, um, there's just some oh. really, really, really awesome stuff. And, uh, oh, yeah. you're going to get, you're going to get a lot of, of moments in the show. that are going to make you feel uneasy and that's intended. That's full on intended. If you didn't yeah. feel uneasy, I'd be worried about you. There are going to be moments that make you very sad and somber. There are going to be moments that just fill you with joy and elation. Um, But I'm telling you, episode 12, I full-on broke down crying my eyes out. Um, Trying to remember what happened in that episode. With the whole micro and his family. Oh, Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, dude. Whew. Powerful stuff. Powerful stuff. Yeah, you know, like the, the acting. We do spoil it is, some elements, much. but I don't want to spoil everything for people, of course. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Like, it's just... It's, it's like I said, it's a different Punisher story. It is but not it's okay. anything that I've been used to with Punisher. Like, I remember watching it thinking, like, this is unique to Punisher. Wholeheartedly unique to Punisher. That's what I really enjoyed about it too, um, it because you know it's very difficult in this day and age to give us something we haven't seen from a character who's been around for so long, and they knocked it out of the park. They absolutely did. Also, when he finally gets to catch up to Agent Orange and gets that face to face showdown, that. Thumbs yeah. in the eyes, man. Oh, yeah. that was so awesome. Yeah, I agree. Um, Disgusting, but awesome. Uh, so we ran out of time, Josh. So go ahead and give your recommendation, and then I'll I'll do mine. Oh, absolutely, one hundred percent. If you like comic book characters, if you enjoy the Marvel Netflix shows, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, if you enjoy the Punisher, if you like the Thomas Jane movie, the Ray Stevenson movie, even the Dolph Lundgren movie. Or if you just like a good, well-told, dramatic slash action show, give The Punisher a view. It is well worth your time. Some heartfelt, heartwarming stories, some tragic stories, some entertaining, uh, just a lot of good all the way around. I can't recommend it enough. It is my favorite Marvel Netflix show to this point. It has surpassed Daredevil Season 2 and Jessica Jones for me. Interesting, interesting. I, I I don't agree entirely, and I'll explain why. Um, loved the show. Thought it was fantastic. I had no problems with it other than a few boring moments. Uh, but those boring moments did stand out. They did, they did sour it a little bit. Um, so, like, if I were to give it an out of 10, it wouldn't be a 10. It'd be probably be a 9. Uh, but that being said, like, a 9 is still amazing. A 9 is still awesome. And the show, the show is fantastic. The CGI is on point when it comes to, like, bullet shots or, or just, uh, you know, like, uh, 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 visual effects like blood and, and broken bones and stuff like that are really, really well, well shown. Um, the, the acting is, is, is top notch. Um, I think that uh, uh, this guy who plays uh, Frank, I cannot remember his name for the life of me. Um, oh, John Bernthal? John Bernthal, he is a totally different Punisher than what you've seen. Um, in, my mind, in my mind. I think he's the best, too. Uh, yeah, at this point, he's the best actor to play the Punisher. I said that during Daredevil Season 2. I remember that much. But, um, uh, it's it, like I said, if you're going into it expecting Punisher, 90s Punisher, you're not going to get it. 
You're not going to get it. You're going to get an entirely new and different Punisher, which there's nothing wrong with that. It's fun. Uh, it's very, very dark, much darker than what you've seen. And um, uh, I, think that I thank for that because I'm thankful for that because it, it was definitely something that I had been pining for for a long time. Um, but, uh, you know, Josh is correct about, like, a lot of the other stuff that he said about, like, um, about, like, uh, if you enjoy good drama, if you enjoy fun, like, to an extent murder mystery sort of things, like trying to figure out who done it, um, but even figuring out who done it, like, it's figuring out how is it going to be salute, you know, solved, um, all that stuff is super fun. Uh, and, um, but again, it is, it is dark. It is, it is heavy themed. Um, it'll make you, uh, cry. It'll make you quit. Like, like wince, like, like, you know, like the guy getting his hamstring slashed, like, ugh. yeah, it'll make uh, you cringe, but I still highly recommend it. I still highly like take the time to watch all 13 episodes. Cause it's worth, it's worth it. It's absolutely worth it. And it is easily one of the best Marvel shows today. I still think that my favorite is probably, uh, Luke Cage. Um, I think that was one of the most well-made Marvel shows. Uh, I still need to finish that one, to be honest. So full disclosure, I haven't watched all the Marvel shows yet. <laughs> I'll, I'll say this much. When it comes to the Marvel shows, it, it, in, in order of best to worst, it goes um, Luke Cage, Daredevil Season... No, Luke Cage, Daredevil Season 1, Jessica Jones... Uh, Punisher, Daredevil Season 2, Iron Fist. Iron Fist is by far the worst. I guess somewhere but, in there is, is Defenders, but I don't know where. I haven't watched it or Iron Fist yet either. But That's yeah. another thing. That's another thing that we should mention. You don't have to have watched any of the other Marvel shows to watch this one. Absolutely. You could have never, you've never seen a movie. You could have never seen... Uh, uh, I mean, this is such a standalone experience that that, that nothing else matters. It will help if you have seen Daredevil season two, but it is not necessary to know what is going on. It's not necessary. And it's not necessary to catch up. If you had not seen Daredevil at all, especially season two when he was in it, there's only a couple of references back to his time in that. So. But even then, even then, it's 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 pretty easy to understand. Like, it, like the reference that that pops up is very like okay, so that's what happened. <laughs> um. But uh, it's yeah, it's it's a fantastic show, and I definitely highly I highly recommend. It. Um, okay, so that's good. So we had two good shows. We had two things that we recommend. Uh, some caution going into them, of course, but I think you know that's just how it's going to be with those shows. Um, next week we have two shows that are also going to be heavy themed. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, there's there's Mudbound, which is a film on Netflix. Um, I didn't look too much into it. I just know that it has to do with like post, uh, post slavery era, um, and uh, the conflict there within. Um, so I'm interested to see that. Uh, and then Godless. What's Godless about, Josh? Uh, Godless is set. I'm not sure. Let me just double check. Um, <laughs> I know it's set, and it seems to be late 1800s. Um, yeah, 1880s American West and um, Outlaw Terrorizing 1880s American West hunts down a uh, partner turned enemy and he hides out as a ranch uh, in a town mysteriously made up almost entirely of women because all of the men are dead. Cool. Cool. That's going to be fun. And both are, uh, our Godless is a, sh is a short miniseries, right? Yeah, it's like six or se it's seven. Let me see how many episodes. Uh, one, two, seven episodes. But they're, they range anywhere from 50 minutes to an hour and 20 minutes in length. So some of them are movie length. Um, the longer ones are about 80 minutes long some of the shorter ones are 50 minutes long so overall that would be like you know the equivalent of watching 10 or 11 episodes at one hour so That's i good. figured that was i figured that was a good uh 
a good... Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's going to help with you and I both because uh, right now we're, you know, we're, we're gearing into the holiday season and we're both very busy. So having, yeah. short, having short shows, I'm sure that by the time we record the next episode, uh, we'll also have picked two short shows. Uh, just so that way we're not inundated with too much. Um, but you know, once once the turn of the the year happens and we're you know our schedules are more open, we'll have more time to watch longer longer length shows, and we'll probably add some Hulu and Amazon and maybe even YouTube Red shows in there. I don't know. We'll see. Um, Always open I mean, for the possibilities. <laughs> but that being said, guys, uh, Josh, where where can they uh, follow you on the internet? Go going through your Twitter in there, even though I throw it in the show as well. Well, the Twitter account is below, uh, at Insabonor1976. I also stream on twitch.tv slash Insabonor76. Uh, sporadic there, so you got to follow me on Twitter to see when I go live. <laughs> there you go. Uh, but other than that, those are the, you know, those are the public places that they can find me. Okay. Um, guys, you can, again, follow me on Twitter. Uh, that's where I'm going to post all of my reviews that I do on the website, which is missionstartpodcast.com. Um, uh, it's where I also you know, show that I'm going live on either my personal channel, which is twitch.tv slash chubrockgeek, or when I go live on Half Empty Interstink, which this is my last month. I have one more month of this, and then I'm no longer on that channel. So come watch my last few streams, or at least pop in and say hi. Um, but it's uh, it's twitch.tv slash half empty e tank, or just go to h e e t dot tv uh, to watch. Um, uh, also, uh, every Saturday, sorry, every Sunday, <laughs> my bad. Every Sunday on twitch.tv slash mission start p. Uh, you can watch Anthony and I do our our video game news podcast. We basically take some of the stories that happen throughout the week and we discuss them. We give our opinions, we give uh, ideas, advice, yada yada yada. Um, but it's also an inter- interactive uh, talk show where uh, we we take uh, comments from the chat. Um, I know that Josh pops in from time to time and says uh, his thoughts on something. Um, but we've also started doing a cool thing where we have a thirty minute uh bullshit session where we uh just kind of talk and warm up for the main podcast and then we have a post 30 minute session where if there's anything that we didn't talk about in our episode that you'd like us to discuss we can have it there uh it's not it's not a concrete 30 at the end it's a concrete 30 in the beginning i tell you that much but not a concrete 30 at the end but here's the thing the the beginning and end are for stream only so if you're if you're listening to the podcast and you want to hear that you got to come to the stream um other than that, guys, that's going to be it for us this week, or this episode. I keep saying this week because I'm so used to the podcast. Uh, this one comes out every other week. So um, uh, I don't want to say bi-weekly because bi-weekly means two a week, I think. Or does that mean every other week? No, every other week. So it is bi-weekly. Okay. Just I want to clarify that. So it is a bi-weekly podcast. Um, again, guys, thank you guys for listening. If you've made it all the way through the podcast and listened to our ramblings. Uh, we are, Josh and I are thoroughly enjoying doing this, whether anybody listens to it or not, because we get to actually discuss things that we watch and that's fun. And plus I would probably never watch half the stuff that we reviewed on here had it not been for the podcast. So, and we've um, turned out to found some very enjoyable things thus far too. I haven't, I haven't disliked anything we've watched. I haven't disliked anything totally. There have been things I have disliked, but not overall, but yeah, that's, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, follow that Twitter account. Let us know what you guys want to hear talk about. Yeah, uh, at all, or at, yeah, at Queued Up Podcast. I couldn't get all queued up just because somebody else had it, but Queued Up Podcast. Um, all right, guys, thank you again for listening, and we will see you next time. Take care, everyone.